Elhamdülillahi Rabbil, elhamdülillahi Rabbil Alemin Ve sallallahu ve sallam ve baraka Nabi Muhammedin ve ala alihi ve sahbihi ecmain So as always we thank you all for coming and taking time out of your Monday evening to join us in our attempt to remind ourselves of our duty to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and to help ourselves become primarily better worshippers of Allah and also better, better humans. And our current series is Love and Marriage in Islam. And this is part three. Previously we provided an introduction to the topic. And then last week we talked about getting married. Today inshallah ta'ala we'll talk about being married, the do's and don'ts of a happy union. The do's and don'ts of a happy union. Let me begin by saying that marriage is from the deen of Allah. And it is a means to draw closer to Allah. In that regard, it is similar to a salat similar to a siyam similar to a zikat similar to al hajj just like these what we typically would refer to as rituals draw us closer to allah marriage is also a means to draw us closer to allah and we need to understand that and the better we understand that the more likely we are to be attentive to our marriages as the Prophet ﷺ said in the hadith, إذا تزوج العبد فقد استكمل نصف دينه فليتق الله في النصف الآخر He said if a person gets married, he has completed half of his religion. That's pretty tremendous. So let him fear Allah regarding the other half, the Prophet said Sallallahu So that teaches us that it is incumbent, I mean that marriage is not just a part of the deen, it's a big part of the deen to the part to the point that the Prophet Sallallahu said that it's half of the deen. And so what that should make us understand, brothers and sisters, is that it's incumbent upon us to work hard and to strive intently to be to be good husbands and wives. We should not be overly self-confident when it comes to our relationships. We shouldn't be the people who say, I got this, I'm the ideal spouse. And I've actually heard people say that. We also shouldn't be complacent. The people who say, what I'm doing is enough. My spouse can take it or leave it. We shouldn't be lazy when it comes to our marriages the people who are unwilling to make any effort or any additional effort. And we shouldn't be the people who are oblivious in our relationships, the people who are like, like what? Always like, what? What's the problem? I don't, I don't see any issue. The people who their marriage is in crisis, but they're so oblivious, they're so not self-aware that they don't see that their marriage is in crisis they don't see that their spouse is unhappy we can't be oblivious this is what the prophet in a roundabout way is telling us when he says if a person gets married he has completed half of his faith it's like marriage is a big deal he's saying and we have to take it as a big deal so today, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to mention nine, perhaps ten, I may add a tenth one, do's and don'ts. And so when we come across a do, we have to ask ourselves, am I doing that? This is something I should be doing. Am I doing it? And if we come across a don't, something that we shouldn't be doing, we should ask ourselves, am I avoiding this? Because if we answer no to either of those or both, then that's, that's a problem. Uh, the first 
do is get your priorities straight. It's important for us to realize, brothers and sisters, that after our parents and our blood relatives, no one is more deserving of our good character, our fine manners, our kindness, and our respect than our spouse. So we have to make sure that our behavior reflects this. In the hadith collected by, by Ahmed and al Nasai on the authority of Aisha, the Prophet ﷺ was asked, Ya Rasulullah, Man a'dhab al nasi haqqan al mar'a. Said, O Messenger of Allah, who has the most right over a woman? Who has the most right to her respect, to her honor, to her care, to her concern? Who's our number one priority? Anybody want to guess what she said? What he said? Ha. Huh. Zawjuha. Said her husband. And in the hadith, collected by Tirmidhi, rahimahullah ta'ala, on the authority of Aisha, the Prophet, والسلام, he said, خيركم, خيركم لأهلي, خيركم لأهلي. He said, the best of you are those who treat their wives the best, and I'm the best of you in the treatment of my wives. And Imam al-Shawkaniyu, rahimahullah ta'ala, he comments on this hadith in his book, Nail Al-Awtar. And I'd like to share to you, uh, Nail Al-Awtar. I'd like to share with you his commentary because it's very beautiful. He says, فِي ذَلِكَ تَنْبِيهٌ عَلَىٰ أَعْلَى النَّاسِ رُتْبَةً فِي الْخَيْرِ وَحَقُّهُمْ بِالْإِتِّصَافِ بِهِ وَهُوَ مَنْ كَانَ خَيْرَ النَّاسِ لِأَهْلِي فَإِنَّ الْأَهْلَى هُمَّ الْأَحِقَّاءُ بالبشر وحسن الخلق والإحسان وجلب النفع ودفع الذر says the hadith calls attention to the person who has reached the highest level of goodness and who is most deserving of being described with it and he is the one who treats his family the best for indeed one's family are those most entitled to a pleasant expression good character kind treatment, acts of benevolence, and protection from harm. فَإِذَا كَانَ الرَّجُلُ كَذَلِكَ فَهُوَ خَيْرُ النَّاسِ وَإِنْ كَانَ عَلَى الْعَقْسِ مِنْ ذَلِكَ فَهُوَ فِي الْجَانِبِ الْآخَرِ مِنَ الشَّرِّ He says, whenever a man is like this, he is the best of people. And whenever he is the opposite of this, then he is on the other side of the spectrum of evil, and wickedness. Then he goes on to say, وَكَثِيرًا مَا يَقَعُ النَّاسِ فِي هَذِهِ الْوَرْطَةِ فَتَرَى الرَّجُلُ فَتَرَى الرَّجُلَ إِذَا لَقِيَ أَهْلَهُ كَانَ أَسْوَأَ النَّاسِ أَخْلَاقًا وَأَشْجَعَهُمْ نَفْسًا وَقَلَّهُمْ خَيْرًا وَإِذَا لَقِيَ غَيْرَ الْأَهْلِ مِنْ الْأَجَانِبِ لَانَتْ عَلِيكَتُهُ وَانْبَسَطَتْ أَخْلَاقُ وَجَادَتْ نَفْسُهُ now listen to this, he says, And many people fall into this error. You see a man, if he enters his home, he is the worst of people and manners, the most intimidating, and the least kind and compassionate. But if he meets his companions and comrades, he is soft-spoken, well-mannered, easygoing, and extremely generous. وَلَا شَكَّ أَنَّ مَنْ كَانَ كَذَلِكَ فَهُوَ مَحْرُومُ التوفيق. He says, and there can be no doubt that whoever is like this has been forbidden success and has, devi- and has deviated from the right way. May Allah protect us. End of quote. So basically, the message here is that we have to make our, pro- our, our, our spouses our priority. Make them the primary recipient, recipient of our graciousness, of our kindness, of our respect. And we have to avoid the mistake that lots of people make. And that is that they're on their best behavior outside of the home. And when they're at home, they're on their worst behavior. So for example, a man comes home and he finds his wife just kind of like disheveled. Her appearance is far from attractive. Her smell, 
is far from attractive. And if he inquires, she says she's too busy, she doesn't have time to make herself up, to make herself look nice, to put on nice clothing, to take a shower, whatever it is. But then she's invited, invited to a tea party, invited to a walima, invited to something. And all of a sudden she finds the energy, she finds the time to go and shower, to do her hair, to do her makeup, to find her finest dress, etc. and so on. This is not how it should be. Likewise, a woman asks her husband, she needs something, money for the house, money to buy her needs. And he says, I don't have any money. Then he gets a call and somebody says they need to borrow some money. And all of a sudden, he has the money. Shouldn't be. That the family takes priority. And this is the message um, that we should take away from our first do, is to get our priorities straight. Husband is the number one priority. Wife is the number one priority, and we need to act like it. But then by that, another do, treat your spouse as you would like to be treated. Treat your spouse as you would like to be a treat as you would like to be treated. I think all of us are aware of the hadith collected by Al Bukhari Muslim on the authority of Anas, in which the Prophet وسلم, he said, La yu'minu ahadukum hat la yu'minu ahadukum hatta yuhibba li akhihi ma yuhibbu li nafsi. None of you truly believes until he loves for his brother what he loves for himself. And he said in the hadith collected by Muslim on the authority of on the authority of Musa al Ashari, he said, "Wal yati ila nasi." He was speaking in the context of the person who would like to enter paradise and be far removed from the hellfire. And he mentioned certain qualities that he should have, and one of the qualities he said, "Wal yati ila nasi ma yuhibbu an yuta ilay." He said, and let him give people the treatment that he would like to receive. Now, in both contexts, the Prophet is either talking about our brothers and sisters in faith who are not related to us, or talking about people in general, people that may be complete and total strangers. If the Prophet is saying this about people we're not related to, and we're not married to, or people that we don't even know, okay, on a personal level, then certainly this applies to what? To our spouses, to the people who are the closest ones to us, right? After our blood relatives. And so what does this entail? This entails that you acknowledge that your partner is not an extension of you. Solely present to make you happy. I've actually heard a man say to his wife, you are here to serve me. You are here for my pleasure. That is why you're here. That's it. And obviously that didn't last very long. Al-Muhim, that attitude, what message does it send to the other person? That I have no meaning, I have no agency, I, I have no... My wants are insignificant, they mean nothing. They're trivial at best. Your spouse is not just an extension of you, just there to make you happy, but rather they're a separate person with their own needs, their own wants, which are equal and in importance and value to your, to your own. This is how you have, to, you have to see it in order to treat them the way you want to be treated. So we always have to put ourselves in their shoes and look at the situation from their perspective and strive to provide for their wants and needs, even if it means sacrificing our own. And this is important because when we're in these relationships and our partner is telling us directly or indirectly, I need this from you. I, I, I want this from you. I'll be happy if you, know, if you do this, if you can treat me like that, if you can talk to me in this way. We can have the, the attitude of, why? Why should I? What's in it for me? We can't have that attitude because we also have wants and needs. 
and we want them to be fulfilled. And so we have to treat them and treat their wants and needs the way we want our wants and needs to be, to be treated. طيب. Number three from the do's. Be considerate of your spouse's sensibilities. What's a sensibility? Any takers on that? What's a sensibility? What's sensitive level. Huh? Their sensitivity level. Their sensitivity level? Not, that's close. Something that they're sensitive about. It's like a pet peeve, right? Something that it annoys them. Something that vexes them. Something that upsets them to no end. That's a sensibility. Right? And everybody has them. Is that not so? We all have pet peeves. We all have things that we just don't like. Like, for example, um, let's say a pet peeve could be somebody sitting at the table eating and they smack. You guys know smack. They eat with their mouth open and they make that noise, right? People grit their teeth. These are examples of what? Of pet peeves. I mean, they're minor examples, uh, but they're examples of pet peeves or sens sensibilities, right? If we know that our spouse has a pet peeve, they have something that if we do it, it annoys them. It upsets them to no end. And we know that if we do it, it's going to put unnecessary strain on what? On the relationship. And there won't be, it, it won't be, there won't be any skin off our nose. It won't cause us any discomfort if we just what? If we abandon it. Then what should we do? We should abandon it. We should leave it. We should stay away from that. Provided that they're not the type of person who everything annoys them. Because you can't live like that. You can't live if everything annoys them. Right? But they're a person who, they have a few things that they really don't like it if you do it. If you do it, you'll put unnecessary strain. You'll upset them. You'll make them feel that you don't care about their sensibilities. On the other hand, it doesn't hurt you in the least. It doesn't harm you in the least. No skin off your nose. If you abandon it, you're supposed to abandon that. And it's important here not to get bogged down. A lot of people get bogged down with the religious ruling. They say, it's not haram. So why should I have to not do it? Why should I have to stop doing this thing which is not haram? So for example, let's say that um, there's something that the husband wears that the wife wishes he wouldn't wear. And when he wears it, it upsets her. Vice versa, there's something that the woman wears. That when, the, when she wears it, the husband feels what? Feels upset. He really wishes she wouldn't, she wouldn't wear that. And whatever that garment is, is something that's perfectly permissible for her to wear and perfectly permissible for him to wear. But when they wear it, it makes them very what? Upset. So upset, because they've had so many arguments about it, the person instead of arguing, just what? They withdraw. They may go and stay out of the house the whole day. When they come home, they don't speak. They're quiet. They're not talkative. They don't want to engage. All because of what? Something that she wore that he didn't approve of or vice or vice versa. In cases like this, we're supposed to be considerate. You're supposed to think of the other person. And if you do that, you'll achieve both Allah's pleasure in the hereafter. And you'll also achieve peace and happiness in your marriage in the life herein. And there's an example of this from the life of the Prophet ﷺ and that of his companions. And that is an example from Asma bint Abi Bakr, who was married to Abdullah ibn Zubair. I'm sorry, she was married to Az Zubair ibn al Awam. I'm sorry. So she says in this example, she says, I used to carry grain on my head from Az Zubair's plot, which the Prophet had allocated him to cultivate. It was about two-thirds of a farsakh, about a mile and a quarter from the city center. So she would go, she would harvest grain, she would put it in maybe a basket or a bag, carry it on her head for a mile and a quarter. And we're not talking about a mile and a quarter of paved road, asphalt. We're talking about what? Rugged, no, rugged, rocky terrain and most of the people were poor 
I mean, they didn't have shoes. They didn't have sandals. Some of them had socks and some of them had bare, bare feet. Mile and a quarter. Is that a lot or a little? It's a lot. So she said, one day I was on the road carrying grain on my head when I met the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi and a group of his companions. He called out to me and stopped his camel so that I could ride behind him. Who is this? Rasulullah. Is there any fear that there's going to be any illicit behavior or any mischief or anything like that? And what is the Prophet trying to do? Trying to help. Feels sorry, feels p- pity for, for the woman. She says, I felt shy. And I thought of a Zubair and his jealousy. That he might even be jealous of who? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That this would upset him, even though it's the message of Allah. Now, she could have said, well, It's a long way. And it's Rasulullah. And even if he gets mad, it's worth it because I'll say, I'll spare myself the pain and the anguish and and, and everything. It's kind of worth it to be yelled at. But you know what she did? She said, I remembered his jealousy and he was the most jealous of men. And the Prophet, sensing my discomfort, rode on. I just stood there. I didn't get on. And the prophet figured it out that I wasn't going to get on. And he rode on. And she walked. So I say this to say that look at to the extent that she considered his sensibilities. In our cases, in most cases, nobody's asking us to walk a mile barefoot on rocks. They're saying, I would appreciate it if you didn't leave the house without my permission. I would appreciate it if you didn't wear that abaya because it describes your shape. I would appreciate it if you didn't uh, go to this place because there are, you know, there are certain things that happen in that place. And sisters frequent that place. I don't want you in that place with those sisters and I'm not with you. Whatever it is. Sensibility, consider. Be considerate of the sensibility. It's worth it for your happiness in this world and Allah's pleasure in the hereafter. Tayyip, another do, and I have three here that are closely related, but they deserve individual consideration, and we'll mention them kind of ala ujala, kind of quickly. So the first one is lift your partner up rather than put them down. So, One of the things that happens, unfortunately, in marriages is that people, um, they hurl insults at each other when they get mad. Sometimes when they're not mad. Sometimes they just think it's, it's okay to call their wife or their husband by an offensive nickname, right? Pig. A'udhu Billah. Kelb. A'udhu Billah. But people do, right? So this is one of the fastest ways to introduce animosity, tension, resentment, and bitterness into your relationship. Like what? Calling somebody by bad names. And these emotions, resentment, bitterness, animosity, maybe even get to the point of hatred, they all undermine what we're trying to achieve, which is tranquility, love, and mercy. Right? How many people are going to How can saying something that will make your partner feel sad, insecure, and inadequate, how can that invoke happiness? How can that make them feel loved? How can that make them love you? When you're abusing them with your words. How can there be mercy in a marriage when cruel things are said and done? And perhaps this is why the Prophet advised, he said, وَلَا تُقَبِّحْ He said, do not say to your spouse you are ugly. Okay, but people do. But the Prophet specifically said, وَلَا تُقَبِّحْ Do not say to your spouse you are ugly. In a roundabout way, the Prophet is saying, don't insult or say cruel things to each other. He also said, مَن يُؤْمِنُ بِاللَّهِ وَالْيَوْمِ الْآخِرِ فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا 
أو لا يصمد. He said, he who, he who believes in Allah in the last day, let him say something good or remain silent. In the marital context, what does it mean? The scholars have mentioned it means basically four things. So pay attention to these four things. Number one, say nice rather than derogatory things. Say nice things. Okay? Everybody, your spouse, and we're going to talk about this shortly, has good qualities. Every spouse has good qualities. Yeah, you can find something bad, and therefore you can, say, you can find something bad to say. But every spouse has good qualities, which means you can find something good to say. So say those things. Say the nice things. Speak kindly and politely as opposed to harshly and impolitely. Number three, if there's more than one way to say something, choose the best and nicest way to say it. Right? There's two ways to say something. Choose the best way to say it. Right? And if you are too angry or upset to comply with this standard, then remain silent and say nothing until you can. We all make mistakes. If you make a mistake, if a mistake is made, let me say this first. Two spouses, one of them says something, as we say, out of pocket. The other spouse Call them on it. Say, that hurt my feelings. Why would you say that? That's a mean thing to say. Call them on it. And when you're called on it, the other spouse should do what? Apologize. I'm, I'm sorry. You're right. I shouldn't have said that because we're all human. But what we can do is on the one side, let it go because it will start to be normalized. And on the side of the one who re, who's been called on it, you can't just what? Oh, I was mad. Don't justify it. Just I'll eat it. I'm wrong. I'm, you got me dead to rights. I'm sorry. I apologize. I shouldn't have said that. And I won't say it again. The, sec the next one, which is also a do, is accentuate the positive. Which is, again, as we said, related to lifting up your partner. Accentuate the positive. It's impossible, ha it's impossible to be happy in a relationship if you have a cup half full mentality grass is green on the other side mentality all you can see is what your spouse doesn't have can't do won't give will never become will never achieve or otherwise lacks if this is your attitude you'll never be happy because all you see is what what you don't have all you see is what's missing so what you have to do is you have to change your perspective. Stop looking at the cup as half empty, but look at it rather as half what? Half full. No spouse is perfect. al kamalu lillah, perfection, is the exclusive property of Allah, if you will, or quality of Allah. And every human being has imperfections, idiosyncrasies, and shortcomings. As the Prophet said in the hadith, Kulu ibn Adam, khatta, every human being has faults, has mistakes, has shortcomings. So if you want to be happy, you have to learn to accentuate the positive and downplay the negative you perceive in your spouse. And in many cases, the negative we see, or we, the negative is something perceived and not real. It's not actual, but it's rather imagined. But in spite of this, the Prophet said, because we're all human, we do have shortcomings. He said, He said, let not any believing man despise a believing woman. If he dislikes some quality that she has, he is undoubtedly pleased by another. Let's say that a man has a wife and he's really into long hair and she has short hair. It just it's short and it's thin. It doesn't grow long. It doesn't grow full. It doesn't grow thick. And that to him is an ape. That to him is a fault. It's a shortcoming. But she's a great cook. Right. And she is very charming. She's a very good host. So when he brings has guests, he's never disappointed. Right. 
She's an awesome housewife. She's an awesome mother. And in most cases, it's like this. The woman has 10 pros for every what? For every con. So that's what we have to do. We have to look at what? All of these pros and focus on that. And if we do that, it'll eclipse the, the cons. You won't even see the cons. Tayyip, one last one which is related to that, that, that list I said, which is give thanks, which is also a do. Give thanks, show appreciation, and don't take your spouse for granted. Give thanks, show appreciation, and don't take your spouse for granted. The Prophet said in the hadith, مَنْ لَا يَشْكُرَ النَّاسِ لَا يَشْكُرَ اللَّهِ Whoever does not thank people has not properly thanked Allah. This is something that early on in your marriage you have to understand. This is a reality about people. It's even more reality about spouses. Why? Because spouses, people in a relationship, want validation from their partner more than anyone else. Everybody in the dunya can chat your wife up. But if you don't, she feels like she's nothing. Vice versa. Everyone can chat your, 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 your husband up. Oh, he's such this and he's, this, he's so that and everybody loves him. But if he comes home and doesn't get that from his family, he feels a certain type of way. And so it's important for us as spouses to be very thankful, overly appreciative of what? Of our spouses. So we need to make it a point to say thank you when they do something for us or just thank them for what? For being our spouse. Thank you for loving me. Thank you for supporting me. Thank you for putting up with me. So they don't have to do anything special. You just thank them for, for being there. Right? And some people in reality, brothers and sisters, they struggle with this. As sad as it is, as easy as it is, as easy as it is, as easy as it is to just say Thank you. Jazakallah khair. I really appreciate this. As these words to me, they just roll off my tongue. I think they're easy to say. I think when we're with other people, we say them easily. But for some reason with our spouses, it's like we, we struggle to utter these words. I, I, it baffles me. It boggles my mind because really who does more for you than, than your spouse? Some people, they struggle with thanks because they're not accustomed to kindness. They lived a life where everybody took and nobody ever gave anything. They're not used to somebody being nice, giving them, taking care of them. So they've never been in a position where they had to say thanks. So when that happens, they, they don't know what to do. And some people, they struggle with thanks because of their Sent because of their ego, because of their pride. They feel that saying thank you detracts somehow from their dignity, their self-respect, their self-image. They are somehow less of a man or less of a woman if they thank someone. Whatever the case may be, saying thank you is required. As the prophet said, if you don't thank the people, you haven't thanked Allah, you have to thank him. Whether you like it or not, you got to force yourself to thank him. Twist your own harm. Whatever you got to do, force, force yourself to thank them. And force your thank you to come out like you mean it. No. Say it like you mean it. Right? Say it from your chest. Thank you. I really appreciate this. And you're like, come on, man. It's just some noodles I warmed up. What? But you are making a big deal out of it because you really, really appreciate you, them because it's them, because it came from them, right? And even if it doesn't come naturally, there's lots of things that we're supposed to do as Muslims that don't come naturally. And what, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to work at it. So you work at this. You work at being better at thanking your spouse and giving them the credit they deserve. So uh, how many have we covered so far? Six. You keep in tally, uh, Jamia. You did pretty good last week. Should I trust you or should I double check? I, I went to get it and you, I, you were gone. <laughs> okay, man, my word. All right, let's review really quick. So the first one we said was get your, get your priorities straight. Number two was treat your spouse as you would like to be treated. Number three, be considerate of your spouse's 
sensibilities. Number four, lift your spouse up. Don't put them down. Number five, accentuate the positive. Number six, give thanks and be appreciative. Thayip. Okay, we should be able to get home in the next few minutes and get you guys out of here. Thayip. All right. So we're number seven, right? Be affectionate. Be affectionate. Kisses, hugs, holding somebody's hand. All of these other expressions of affection, they don't cost you what? They don't cost you anything. They come, they're free. So there's no reason to be stingy with them. Your partner doesn't want you to just tell them that you love them. They want you to show them. They want to feel your love. And one of the best ways you can make your partner feel your love is through affection, being affectionate. If we don't show any affection, if we're cold, if we're distant, then saying I love you in the in the ears and in the heart of our spouse, it just becomes what? Hollow words with no real meaning, no real substance, because I don't feel the love. It's like your 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 actions are betraying your speech. You guys see that? And you have to know. That the that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا You have in the Messenger of Allah the most excellent example. This, is a, this, is, this ayah is Amma. It's a general ayah. It encompasses everything. He's the best example of everything. And one of the examples that he gave us was he was an extremely affectionate husband. A, extremely affectionate. To the point of Ibn al-Qayyim, he writes in his book, Zad al-Ma'ad, he talks about how the Prophet was with his wives. He dedicates a section of his book how the Prophet was with his wives. And I'll spare you the Arabic just for the sake of time. But I'll read to you some of the passages that he, that he mentions about how the Prophet was with his wives. He said, If she, meaning Aisha, radiallahu anha, drank from a vessel, he would take it and put his mouth where her lips had been. And if she ate meat from a bone, he would take the bone and place his mouth where hers had been. He used to lie down in her apartment with his head on her lap and recite the Quran even if she was menstruating. When her period came, he didn't distance himself from her or make her feel unwanted. Rather, he would command her to tie a piece of cloth around her midsection and then he would fondle her and he would kiss while he was fasting. He would sometimes hold hands with one of his wives in the presence of the others. Extremely affectionate. Laying his head in her lap. Kissing, even while he was fasting. Holding hands, etc. and so on. And so this is the prophet who is the most excellent example for husbands to follow and for wives as well. We need to be affectionate. We need to be more affectionate in our relationships, as affectionate as we possibly can. Let's get to a don't now. We did a lot of do's. Let's do a don't. Don't keep score. Don't keep score. Keeping score basically means that I keep a running tally of everything I do. I did this. I did this. I did this. I also keep a running tally of what she does. I compare the two. Hmm. I did this and this is worth 50 points. But she did this, it's only worth 25. She owes me something worth 25. That's keeping, keeping score. Keeping score is wrong for a number of reasons. One, because it indicates that you have a corrupt intention. You're not doing it because it's the right thing to do. You're not doing it because you love your spouse. You're not doing it because you want to please Allah. You're doing it because you want to be compensated. You want some remuneration, right? And so if you do what you do and then your spouse does something and what you what they've done, you don't feel it. Um, it sufficiently compensates you for what you did. Then you'll respond by taking them to task or going on strike, refusing to do anything else until you're fully paid for what you did. And our deen, it mandates that we're not like this. It, in fact, it mandates that we do things for the sake of who? 
the sake of Allah and seeking his pleasure and not to receive something in exchange the, as Allah told the Prophet وسلم, and by extension his ummah he said وَلَا تَمْنُونَ تَسْتَكْثِرُ he said and do, and do not do a favor with the intention of receiving more in return in, 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 with the intention of what? getting something back you guys see that? And this rule applies to our relationships and the fulfillment of our spouse's rights and entitlements, etc. And so we should never observe something, do something for them with the intention of what? Okay, I'm going to do this because I expect to be repaid. Now we might ingest, say, okay, I'm going to do this for you and then I'm expecting such and such favor or whatever ingest. That's fine. Just to be playful with our families, but don't be serious. Don't seriously expect that, okay, if I do this, then you owe me. Basically, we shouldn't have that attitude. But another reason why this uh, keeping score is wrong, because it undermines the feelings of love and mercy. And what we're trying to achieve in our relationship is exactly that, love and mercy. Well, you're undermining that if you keep score. And I'm going to give you an example of a scorekeeper, a statement of a scorekeeper, and tell me if somebody was in a relationship with you and this was their attitude. Would that make you feel loved? Would that make you feel like we're on the same team. We're all in this together. Listen to what the spouse says. I keep a running tally of the things my partner does. Leisure activities. Outings with friends. The amount of time spent with our children and chores completed. I never let my spouse get the upper hand. And when they mess up, I never give them a free pass. If I do my spouse a favor... I make sure to remind them every chance I get and mention the great inconvenience it caused me. What do you guys think? Does that make you feel loved? Oh, remember I picked up that shirt for you from the cleaners? Remember that? And you needed it. If I hadn't got it, you would have never been able to get the cleaners on time. And you needed that shirt for that presentation you had the next day at work. What would you have done if I didn't get that? Hmm. That doesn't make you feel like we're on the same team. It makes you feel like it's a business transaction. You guys see that? And I'll never be able to pay you back for what you, for what you did. Number nine, your marriage, another don't, make your marriage a no meddling zone. Well, it's a do, I guess. It's a do. Make your marriage a no meddling zone. Prophet said in the hadith, من حسن Islam al المرء تركه لما لا لا يعني تركه لما لا يعني He said, for the excellence of a person's Islam is abandoning that which does not concern him. Not putting your nose where it doesn't belong. And this includes, contrary to what many people believe, other people's marriages. And unfortunately, what some couples do is they invite meddling without realizing or perhaps even kind of realizing the damage it could cause. But they invite it anyway. And unfortunately, what a lot of people do is they make their, the way that they operate in their marriages, they make it the standard. And then they expect everybody else to operate the same way. And when they see a couple that doesn't operate the same way and everything is fine, <coughs> they believe that even though it's not broke, we need to, we need to fix it. And so, for example, you have, for example, a husband and wife where the husband, he likes uh, all his meals fresh. And so he tells her, I want you to make smaller portions and cook daily so that we always have fresh food. I'm always eating fresh food. I'm not eating leftovers and nothing goes to waste. Small portions, cook daily. And the wife's good. She's cool with that. She's fine with that. So maybe she has a friend who says, hey, can you come out with me here? Can, we, can you go and do that with me there? Can I come and visit you? She says, no, because I have to cook for my husband. No, I have to cook for my husband. She's like, man, every day, you, you, you're cooking for your husband every day? Cook, some, like, cook something like a big meal and use that joint for three days. You know, so Let that thing stretch for three days. So she's saying, this is what I do. And that maybe works for her in her house, but it's not going to work for this sister in her house with her man. And everybody's married to somebody different with their own what? Sensibilities, right? We talked about that. 
And if that sister listens to what that other sister said and lets her meddle, what are you cooking for him every day for? What, are you, what is he? What is he, a slave driver? What are you? She listens to that. What could that do, potentially? Be single, just like her. Exactly. It's gonna, it, it, it could potentially cause problems in a marriage where there's no problems. It's not broken, but this sister ins- insists on what? Break. Trying to fix it. You see that? But you, I have a husband who, for example, him and his wife have the type of relationship where they do everything together. So he comes home from work and they eat together. They go for walks together. They go to the gym together. They do everything together. So his friends are saying, hey, can, come come hang out with us, man. We're going to go bowling. We're going to go do this. We're going to go, no, I got, you know, me and my wife got plans. Me and my wife got plans. Come on, man. Are you hen pack? Come on, come out with us, man. You got to be a man. You got to be the man of the house. You got to, that works for them. Out of the house all day and all night. And don't, they don't spend quality time with their families. That works for them. It's not going to work for this Man, and by letting them meddle in his relationship and tell him how he should be with his wife, that could do what? Cause problems between him and his family. What we have to do, brothers and sisters, is we have to be smart enough to make our marriages a no meddling zone. Okay? Especially if you're happy. And you're getting advice from somebody who's huh, unhappy or single. I'm not. I'm not taking that advice. I don't have no issues at home. I don't need advice from somebody who's been divorced eight times. See that? I I got this. I'm not trying to be complacent or arrogant. We talked about that in the beginning, but, you know, things are going smooth. If it's not broke, I'm not getting ready to to try to fix it. So this is very, very important. There's lots of examples of meddling. I gave a few, but uh, there's lots of ways that people meddle. Don't let people meddle in your relationship. There's a difference between getting, seeking advice, good advice, because you need it, as opposed to people offering advice that you don't need. It's not helpful. It's actually going to be harmful. So that's nine. Uh, I'll mention a tenth one, ala ujala, and it's another don't. And that's, be, that's uh, don't be abusive. Don't be abusive, and abuse comes in many forms. Abuse is not just physical, although physical abuse is wrong, it's prohibited, and it's, it doesn't belong in a marriage. Nobody's going to love someone that abuses them. And nobody's going to believe somebody who tells them they love them when they abuse them. Anybody who's been in an abusive relationship knows how the cycle of abuse works. Works. The person abuses you, they feel bad. Afterwards, they bring you a gift and they tell you they love you. And then... It happens again, and it happens again, it happens again. Nobody believes that person when they say they love them after they've, they've, they've abused them. And abuse is not just physical, as I said. It could be financial, it could be emotional, it could be verbal, it could be psychological. It can be so many ways. There's no love in an abusive relationship. There's no mercy. Because abuse is what? It's cruelty, right? In practice. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the Quran that our relationships are supposed to target, make the objective, tranquility, love, and mercy. And you're undermining all of that by being abusive. Don't abuse each other. Find a way to express your feelings, your frustrations, your sadness, other than abuse. Saying hurtful things, doing hurtful things. And if you can't, for whatever reason, get along with your partner without abusing them in whatever way you might be abusing them, then yeah, you don't, you don't need to be, be together. And it's better for you, as the Prophet said in the hadith, la darar wa la dirar. No harm of self and no harming of others. So don't expose yourself to be harmed. And don't expose others or subject others to harm. If you can't be with that person without harming them, then leave them alone. La darar wa la dirar. There's no harm, harming of self and no harming of others. So that's ten, ten do's and don'ts of a happy union. Uh, and we'll bring with that our session to a close. If there are any questions. Uh,
Uh, we'll take those. We'll take about 10 minutes of those, and then we'll get out about 8.30, inshallah, hotel. Fadal, Jimmy, I'll tell you how you go. With regards to the meddling, you had earlier mentioned about the rights of a person, person upon another person, which is after the parents comes the spouse. Mm -hmm. So I know a lot of cultures uh, have parents where they pretty much dictate mm -hmm. and say, oh, this is not allowed, and she shouldn't do that, and he shouldn't do this, and he should, and he shouldn't. Where are the lines drawn where it comes to the parents? So-called, you know, quote-unquote meddling within the... I, I mean, just yeah, if, if, if the parents don't have a religious basis for their advice, for their suggestions, for their input, then it's upon the husband or the wife in that relationship whose parents are kind of offering their advice or their input to respectfully, respectfully abstain from accepting it. And the way that they do that may come in different forms based upon what they know about their parents. <clears throat> so they may have to give the impression that, yeah, I'm, yeah, whatever you say, I'm going to accept your advice. And they have no intention of accepting it. That may be the way they have to operate with their, their parents. It may be that they say, I really, really, I, they, I, they can actually say, they feel comfortable and safe saying, I really, really respect and appreciate your advice. I just don't think that that will work in my relationship. I hope that you will understand if I don't act on your advice. They may be in a position to say that and they could say that. But again, if they don't have a religious uh, basis for whatever advice or input they give, and you're not convinced that this advice, implementing it, will help. You're convinced instead that it will hurt. And yet, respectfully uh, abstain from it or refrain from accepting that advice. Sound like my question from the back panel. Okay. okay. The question is, it was mentioned that we as Muslims shouldn't go on these dating websites. Where do we go to find a mate in Islam, especially for those sisters who practice Dean? What are the proactive steps to take to find a partner? Um, I'm not sure who said that you couldn't go on the sites. I did not say that. But perhaps somebody else did, and you respect what they said. I wouldn't recommend going on the sites, but at the same time, I wouldn't say that you can't. I understand that uh, it is difficult uh, to find a suitable partner, and the more wasail, the more means that we have at our disposal to find a, par a partner, uh, the better. These sites, uh, they have good in them, and they have bad in them, and if a person uh, benefits from the good and avoids the bad, and they avoid the haram, then uh, they can uh, use these sites. I wouldn't recommend it, but I also would not prohibit it. That said, um, if a person has, and I imagine the person who's asking is someone who does not have uh, a Muslim family that will provide uh, support in this regard. And that makes us... Sorry about that. Go right ahead. No worries. No worries. Like, um, so at, at any rate, it, 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 the impression I get from the question is that the person does not have any support. And that obviously makes it uh, more difficult. So here, one of the methods a person could use, obviously, is the local community and its leadership to help them find a suitable mate, inform the imam, inform other knowledgeable uh, people in the community. A person can also network with um, other sisters or other brothers, depending on their gender, and basically uh, ask people about, you know, um, candidates. Another way is to connect with other communities. Sometimes a person cannot find anyone in their locality but they can find someone outside of the locality. 
it is definitely important for, uh, let me say this, for uh, Masajid to network with each other and to create infrastructure that facilitates um, the connecting of potential male and potential female spouses. And it's also critical um, that they provide the support. Why? Because they can provide it in a way which is void of some of the concerns and some of the issues that a lot of these sites have. And so this is critical. I know it's not happening on the level that it should, but it needs to happen because we do have to facilitate and help. This is something that Islam wants. It doesn't want people to not be married who want to be married. It wants that process to be facilitated. It wants it to be expedited. And so it's important for um, people in the community to help, to reach out to other people that they may know and their contacts and say, hey, do you know anyone who might be a match for ex-sister or ex-brother? It's important for Masajid to be connected and to have some type of shared list where you can basically, if there's a match in this city to a, a, bo a brother or a sister in another city or another locality, that can that process can be initiated, etc. But I, I do understand, uh, I'm not naive, that it's a struggle. And I, I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help you and to help everyone who's seeking to get married to get married. I mean. Hey, no question. Do I? Exactly. Uh, we'll take uh, one question from the in person audience. Ah, uh, totally. No, 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 no. Let, let's 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 differentiate between seeking advice and receiving unwanted and unsolicited advice. So what we were talking about specifically is receiving unsolicited advice from someone who, when you look at them, you say, "Yeah, this this person is not in a position to advise me." Not in a position simply because they're single, because as you said, a person could be single because of no fault of their own. Okay? But we're talking about, again, somebody who is single because of a fault of their own, offering unsolicited advice to someone who's happily married. This is a specific scenario that we're talking about. And we're saying a person like that, yeah, they probably, if they need advice, should probably look elsewhere. And they haven't solicited the advice. As far as a person soliciting advice from someone they, they feel is wise and qualified and capable, irrespective of their marital status, yeah, that's appropriate because our religion is a religion where the Prophet said, a deen an nasiha. Religion is being sincere and advising sincerely. Yeah, go ahead. One more from the in person, and we'll take one last one from the clubhouse. Okay. There's nothing wrong with a person for a legitimate reason choosing not to get married. Nothing wrong with that. And it doesn't mean that 
there will always be half of a Muslim. That's not what the hadith means. The Prophet ﷺ is basically saying when he said, if a person gets married, he's completed half of his religion. He's basically saying that this is something very, very important in the deen of Allah. And it's something which helps you to worship Allah in ways that are equivalent to half of the deen. That's what the Prophet is saying. He's not saying you become half of a Muslim if you're not married. Um, but he also is encouraging people to get married. And this is not the, the only example. There are many examples in the Quran and in the Hadith where Allah and His Messenger are pushing people, encouraging people to get married. Allah wants every creation to experience being a couple. To the point that he said, وَمِن كُلِّ شَيْءٍ خَلَقَدَا زَوْجِينِ لَعَلَّكُمْ تَذَكِّرُونَ He said, and everything we made in pairs so that you would reflect. He wants everyone to experience the sweetness of marriage. Unfortunately, some of us have experienced the bitterness of marriage. But he wants everybody to experience the sweetness of marriage. And so that's why you find a lot of encouragement in the Quran and in the Sunnah. So for example, the Prophet said the Hadith, he said, Ya ma'ashir shabab, man istata'a minkum al ba'a, fal yatizawwaj. He said, O oh, gathering of young men, whoever amongst you is able to get married, then get married. So, do we encourage the woman or the sister who's been married six or seven times and just hasn't found happiness in those six and seven attempts? But she wants to be to find happiness. She believes it's out there. Yeah, we encourage her. Do we encourage the sister who's kind of embittered because of her experiences? Yeah, we encourage her. We tell you, hey, it is sweet when you find the right one, but we encourage you also to learn from your mistakes. Sometimes we just pick the wrong one and we, or we, we, we pick someone for the wrong reasons. And we have to acknowledge, yeah, this was a mistake that I made. But I, I, I picked this person for the wrong reasons. I didn't pay attention to some of the red flags. I didn't learn from those mistakes. It's not always marriage that's bad. But sometimes it's the way that we went about it or it's the person that we end up, you know, getting entangled with that made the experience bad. But I will say this. That when you find the right person, there's nothing better than being married. There's nothing better than being in love with someone and you can't wait to go home to them. There's nothing better than seeing a text message from that person and being filled with just a feeling you can't describe. That you have somebody in your life that when they, they text you, it, it moves your soul. And so, yeah, we encourage people because there's no better experience than this to the point the Prophet said in the Hadith. He said, a dunya mata. He said, the world is commodities. And he said, the best commodity, the best thing you can possess from this world is a righteous woman, a good woman or a good man. And so, yeah, we, we, we encourage. We will always encourage. As long as the person has that, that raghba, that, that, that desire to be, to be married. Because it's a beautiful thing when you get it right. We'll take one from the clubhouse and then we'll close. Okay, Salaam Alaikum, Sister Khadija. Um, you can go ahead and take the mic. Assalamu um, alaikum, Imam, and everyone um, that's in attendance. I have, I, want, I would ask for you to clarify something for me, Imam. So, um, where do you draw the line? Because you said, like, say for instance, someone has a pet peeve or someone doesn't like an outfit, with the, with, with, ex, with the exception of um, maybe a dress being too tight or their pants being too tight showing your form, at what point would it, be taking away your sense of uh, individuality. Um, I, like for example, my my husband loves these black shoes. Uh, he wore them. I don't know since he was born in Yemen, I think, and they drive me crazy. But I don't abuse it. You know, I just tell him, "Oh, I got those shoes." But at what point does it kind of interfere uh, with your?
your individuality? <clears throat> um, yeah, I, I think you make a good point, and we kind of try to try to allude to that. That what we have to do is be careful as spouses, because we all have pet peeves. We have to be careful not to make everything a pet peeve to the point that we make it extremely difficult for our spouse to be in a marriage with us unless they walk around on eggshells, unless they are constantly hesitating before they do anything out of fear that we will say that this is wrong, they shouldn't be doing that, they shouldn't be wearing that, they shouldn't be saying that, they shouldn't be eating that, they shouldn't be eating like that, etc. So we have to be very careful of that. So it's, there, it's difficult to say specifically, to draw a specific line and say if it's this much or this many pet peeves or something like that, it's very difficult to say that. But basically what I would say is that if a person's pet peeves basically make it extremely difficult for the partner to be comfortable in the marriage, then this is where we're crossing the line. And I'll just mention out of Ujala that uh, in the story of Musa and Al-Khadr in the Quran, when Musa wants to accompany Al-Khadr and gain some of the knowledge that he has, which Musa did not have, in the course of that, um, that companionship, Al-Khadr did something and he told Musa at the beginning, he said, I'm going to do some things, don't ask me about anything I do until I actually voluntarily, I basically voluntarily tell you the reasons why I did the things that I did. So at the very, in the first instance, Musa asked him and he reminded him, he said, Alam aqul innaka lan sabra. He said, didn't I tell you, you wouldn't be able to be patient? And so Musa, he said, he said, La tu akhidni bima nasitu, wa la tu hikni min amri busra. He said, don't take me to task for what I forgot, and do not, um, and do not make things difficult upon me. The scholars of Tafsir, when they comment on that, they say that one of the keys to a good companionship is that you don't, make it difficult for your companion to accompany you. You don't put too many rules and restrictions and etc. and so on on your companion such that they feel extremely uncomfortable being your companion. They can't be themselves in a roundabout way. And so what I would say is that if this is the case for a total stranger or someone who is just a casual companion, it's even more true for your spouse. And so we can't have so many pet peeves that we basically put them in a very tight and restricted situation where they can't be themselves. That's the, probably the best. I know it doesn't, doesn't give you a specific answer, but I think when we're in a relationship, we can gauge ourselves. We can say, yeah, I'm making it too tight. I'm making it too restricted. I need to lay off. And I need to learn to live with some things because this person does have an identity. They do have agency. They do have a right to be, to be themselves. Thank you, brother. You're welcome. And with that, uh, we'll bring it to a close. I do realize that there may be a few other ch uh, questions from the clubhouse audience, and we can all we can collect those as we, as we always have, and either answer those uh, at a later date or answer them next week uh, in our next session. Until then, may Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you all. Thank you all for coming. Hada wa sallallahu wa sallam wa barakatuh. Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi. Edge mate.